Good morning, Charisma. Happy Palm Sunday. Well, you chose a very special day today because we have a very, very special guest. It's an honor for us to have uh, Alan Johnson and Annette with us today. Uh, they are our choice of uh, missionaries, servants of God that we have uh, come to know 10 years ago. If you know Daffy and Nina, so for young people uh, uh, from Northwest University, they, they, they answered the call of God to mission in Thailand and they served with uh, Pastor Alan Johnson. And today I just want to uh, introduce him to you. It's his first time here. Uh, he, he was here when we were still back there in 196 and the, the warehouse that we're uh, renting and he came one of the prayer nights. You know, we love to pray and he's the man of God that has the spirit of prayer and uh, we just want to welcome him tonight. So Charisma, stand up on your feet as we welcome Pastor Alan Johnson to Charisma today. James, my eyes are bad now, so I have to have this special setup because I would be able to take this out and hold it. So that's what happens when you get a little bit older, your eyes are not as good as they want. Black one, thank you. All right, we can have both there. Sounds good. Let's do this. Yes, well, it's fantastic to be here on a Sunday morning. This is my wife up here, Lynette. Glad to be here. We're a bit tired. We, we have had a very, very full house. We have, we're now at the age we have grandkids. So I have uh, a daughter, uh, the youngest daughter, actually they work in Turkey with the same organization, the Southern Government Missions. They work in Turkey. And they are uh, on a deputation here just like us as well. So they're up in the Northwest for seven weeks. So we have a two year old and a two month old in this teeny little house and not getting a lot of sleep. So, um, and then we just had my daughter who lives in Memphis come up with her two-year-old. And so we had all of those people in this one little house. And uh, just got her off there for a So we're tired. And, uh, but for a good, it's, good, it's a good tired, man. It's a great tired. I mean, the little grandkids around, there's so much fun. And, um, man, little kid, you know, it's like the, the little kids are for the young. When you get older, you're like, whoa, how do you stand with these little guys? They're just going. In. So we've had a fantastic time with those guys. And, but it's good to be here. Uh, last uh, fall, I just was coming back from a service out on the coast, and I thought, man, I'm going to stop by and see that uh, Charisma is in, like an evening service. So I stopped by and talked to Pastor James all because I'd been at the prayer meeting, and so I hadn't seen him in many years. Stopped by, and, and, and he said, man, I'd love to have you come. And I said, well, the only open day I have is Easter and Palm Sunday. He said, well, come on, Palm Sunday. So I said, good, well, I'm going to preach on something out of Palm Sunday then. So that's what I've been, I've been working and preparing, and uh, I, enjoy, I enjoy the Bible. So we're going to look at something specifically on Palm Sunday this morning. I want to tell you a little update, too, because he mentioned you do, you do know, uh, some of you know Nina and uh, Duffy, who had been students at Northwest and were part of your church. Then they both came out to Thailand and did two-year assignments there, learned Thai, but they went back and they got married. So we weren't sure exactly what happened. You know, we always tell the young folks, hey, you gotta find the will of the Lord and find it together. And so, you know, see what happens. We never wanna get in the way of, of, of that kind of thing. We ask them to process how the Spirit is guiding them and whether it's some, some are called to a life of singleness and come out. We've had some brilliant single women who have done that, but many of them feel like they just don't wanna do it themselves. So they came back to the States, got married, and then it was a wonderful illustration of how when you something's burning in your own heart, it just keeps coming out to other people. So these guys talk so much about Thailand and their burden for Muslims there and other things that both husbands got interested and that interest turned into a call. And so now both couples want to return back to Thailand to work full time as uh, career workers there among the Muslim people. We have a significant Muslim minority, almost five, probably five million-ish, and there's to this day no known uh, existing church of that people group. 
that actually exists. Now, it might be something kind of underground that people don't know about, a little bit off the radar, but there's no formal group yet, even though there are a number of folks now, thank God, who've come to work specifically with Muslims. So we've been praying for uh, Nina and her husband Kyle, and for uh, Duffy and her husband Tim. And I have good news to report, because Nina and her husband Kyle have been fully approved by the Oregon uh, district where they live to come out as full-time missionaries with the Assemblies of God. So they just got out. They, they, went out, they, went out to, um, they went out to tell Have you actually seen, James, have you seen the video that they set up? Because I I, uh, I think I, I'll have to leave you a copy of it. If I, I'll have to remember to get you a copy. Because they had like an eight-minute thing they shot. Nina and uh, Kyle were able to go to Thailand. And the church sent them down there. They wanted Kyle to look at things. They had a great time. Shot some great videos so you can kind of see some of the things that in that part of the world and what, and what they're going to do. So they're going to be locating down south. We're building, when Lynette and I go back for this, it will be our sixth term. So we have been out 26 years. We're going out for another set. We're going out for a long time. Yeah. So we're, we're, the, we're the long haul deal, man. We have, you know, we're here to stay out, do something. You know, make it happen. That's what we believe in. So we have actually uh, have formed a team. We have eight young people, two two couples, Nina Kabi, one of them, and four single people who are coming on board for two and three year assignments to work with us to uh, reach out to Muslims and to learn how to become team leaders them, themselves. So these folks are going to be in training. It's apprentice style. So we're going to do it, and we're also going to. Uh, be talking and giving them training so that they can hopefully create their own team. So Nina and Kyle are going to create a team and go move down south after they work with us for a while. So this the group is called First Dawn. The, I have the young people come up with a name for it. They're calling it First Dawn because it's the first dawning of the life of Christ for this particular uh, ethnic group, the, the uh, ethnic Thai Muslims and the Malayu speakers. So we're asking people, there's some First Dawn brochures out in the back there. and. Um, we're asking people to really join us in prayer. Already since we formed this team, just began talking about it in the spring, we kind of felt prayer that I should start inviting young people that we had had connections with. And already since that time, we've had three prophetic words come to us independently, just people who didn't even you know, really know anything about us. Uh, and the Lord has given us prophetic words talking about persecution and about violence and suffering. And uh, so we, we know the promises of protection. So we know there's going to be a tremendous amount of backlash against in this minority community uh, when people express an interest. Uh, already we have one guy who is a Muslim older gentleman. It's a woman I'm going to tell you a story about today. And she has brought this man to faith. And he, he has now been completely rejected by his family, kicked out of his home. And I just got an email and they're trying to find housing for himself. So there's that expulsion out. And so we know that as we step out, that there's going to be problems. What, this, this last year, our, a Thai pastor who we were working with in this project uh, accidentally made a mistake. He passed out very innocently. He had a Christmas program at the church. So we had kids from urban poor neighborhoods and some were Muslim background. And they came to this event. And uh, he just thought, hey, I'm gonna, when they're walking out the door, he gave him a little teeny cartoon book that was about Christmas. It was called Manga Kathamad. It was a, about a Christmas little school character, manga, I think. And, you know, it goes through. But it has pictures in there about Jesus and all that stuff and the cross and, and everything. And he didn't even think anything of it. He just passed them out, man, to these little kids. So about a month later, I, I had been gone. So I came back and I went into this Muslim slum where we were doing tutoring in, the, uh, in homes, you know, a little English and stuff like that. Kind of as a way to naturally connect with people. And after we did our little tutoring meeting, I got up, this Muslim man came right up in my face, man, like this, and started screaming. I mean, like, he was screaming. And so all these people kind of looking around, crowding around, and people, moms were watching, and kids were sort of looking at He was just screaming in my face, and he said, get out of here, never come back, you're brainwashing our kids. And he said, you passed out of something at Christmas time. And I was like, hey, I wasn't here, man. I don't know what they did. So I, I just was, you know, apologizing, saying, let me go check it out and everything. But I got kicked out of this place over a small comic book. So you can, you can imagine the reaction when someone actually says, hey, I want to do this or I want to study scripture in adult business. This was just a reaction to children bringing a comic book home. So we, we know, so we're asking, we want to build a team of people who will intercede and pray for First Dawn, pray for people like Luang, who's a convert, pray for these kids who are coming. Some of these kids from the Muslim slum are now coming down to the 
to Bay's Church, and also um, we're asking people to join us in seeking God, praying for mercy, and that the Lord would open, protect those that those first ones who come, and really give them, you know, that grit inside and that love of Jesus that they won't turn back no matter what, because they are going to take a lot of heat for what for their expression of faith in Jesus Christ. So. Thanks for praying for us. Let's, let's turn to scripture today. We're going to look at Mark chapter 11. So mostly I'm going to be right Mark 11. So you can just kind of open there. I'll make a couple of references to some of the other passages that are there. So I hope you're ready for some serious Bible study today. I told Pastor James, yeah, I love to, you know, uh, preach out of scripture. And I have all kinds of stuff I do on mission. But I really wanted to tackle something about Palm Sunday. Because it, it's, it is Palm Sunday. It's a day that in our Christian year, Christian calendar that we celebrate. And so we are going to look at the passage right here in Mark chapter 11. It's going to be verse 1 uh, down to 26. I'm not going to read all of that. What I'll do is sort of narrate some of it, and then we're going to dig into some specific verses. So hold, your, hold yourself right there at Mark 11. I want to start, introduce this, because I'm going to kind of loop back around to this theme in trying to help us understand a very complex uh, passage. Start with, start with a little uh, illustration of something. And when I left 26 years ago to go to Thailand, I, I would illustrate it like this. I'd say, I had one thing in my witnessing toolkit. So if this was a toolkit that had tools in there, I only had one tool. My tool was go and tell people about Jesus, like explain it to them, and then just hope something happens. Now, when I got out to Thailand, primarily a Buddhist country, I, all of that stuff just kind of went out the window because you realize right off the bat, you're not making any sense. It doesn't. It doesn't work. You can talk to people until you're blue in the face. They have all kinds of scripted objections. So when you talk to a Thai person, for instance, I, I would say they say, "Oh, you're a Christian," and they would immediately say, "Every religion is equally good. They teach us to be good people." And they would end the conversation with that thing after you told them about Jesus. Oh, it's all the same. They say, "Mun God, Mun God, it's all the same." And then Mun God. All the religions are equally good. So I very quickly. Uh, Learn. Wow, I can't do it exactly like you know I, I used to do it there. And then I learned something from my Thai friends because I was watching them in what they were doing, and they had a whole, they had a bunch of other stuff in their toolkit that I didn't have. And one of those things was that they prayed for people. They, I, I when I when I was in the states, I have never, I don't remember like how they were just being out on the street corner praying for some person or you know witnessing somebody and then laying hands on a prayer. I never did that. But these people would tell their testimony. And they'd say, oh yeah, God's great, he can really help you. And then they, but then they'd pray for people. They'd say, well, what, what kind of problems do you have? And they'd tease it out of them. You know, they say, I don't have any problems. I'm not sure you've got a problem. They'd well, my auntie and, you know, Nahan Salat has a problem. And they'd, okay, we're going to pray for your auntie. They, so they, they were just really aggressive at prayer. Well, what I started to, when I started to watch is how people process to come to faith. And now, you know, 26 years later, I can tell you a lot uh, about Thai conversion patterns, like how a Buddhist person of this background. Uh, comes to meet Jesus Christ, but there's a little, a little kind of a um, an organizing frame that I, I read one time that I think is very helpful, because a gentleman suggested he said when we look at the Gospels, you see three kinds of encounters that people have with Jesus. You see encounters of power, where Jesus does stuff to them, heals them, delivers them, forgives them. You see encounters about truth, where Jesus is helping people kind of assess who he is, challenging them to, to go, you know, another step. And parables have this kind of function, so that, like, they're kind of knife edges. Are you going to understand? Are you going to be open and go in? Are you going to, you know, misunderstand and go out? Sort of a deal. And then you have, you, then you have allegiance encounters where Jesus is actually, you know, asking people, hey, are you going to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me? So there's these levels of levels of encounter. So what I've watched over the years is that I, I can see that those three things, although the order's different, people come to Jesus that way. And that almost all the time, virtually all the time, those three encounters are part and parcel. So it's not just like talking to somebody and they go, oh yeah, I want to follow Jesus. There's encounters of power. So sometimes power comes first and opens their ears. And then truth and allegiance. And then sometimes they connect with a group of people that's kind of like, yeah, I, you know, I love you guys. I want to kind of be part of it. So they, they start to get kind of allegiance to you and then to church and then sort of then Jesus. And then they get an encounter with power. It goes, wow, this is really real. And they, they understand truth. Sometimes it happens that way. 
Uh, sometimes people, like the classic one, when I was interviewing a, a, a young convert one day and asking her just about Christian identity and how, how the gospel message had fallen on her ear. And she said, well, when I was in college, someone shared about Jesus with me on a Christian friend. And I thought it was stupid, which is what, what many Thai people would think. Or that's not, you know, that's Sasana Fura, it's the white person's religion, not our religion. So we have something. So she rejected that and didn't pay any attention. But then her father became very ill. Her father was on his deathbed. The doctors called and said, hey, Tom Tai, you know, make up your heart because he's going to pass away. There's nothing that can, that can save him now. He's going to die. And so at that moment, where did she turn to? Did she run to a temple? Did she run to a monk? No, she done, she done all that stuff. That stuff doesn't work. She went to her Christian friend. And her Christian friend said, hey, you go and pray for your father in Jesus' name. So this girl, who is not a Christian yet, that doesn't have any understanding other than this friend, she goes and sits by the bedside and she said, Jesus, my friend says you're real. If you're real, touch my dad. Within a week, he was up, out of the hospital, completely healed. The doctors are amazed. And she said, I made a beeline down to that local church and that's when I gave my life to Jesus. It was power. So she encountered truth for her friend. She encountered power that opened her, awakened her to that. And then she said, okay, now I'm going to give my allegiance over to Jesus Christ. So I've, I've just seen this happen over and over and over and over and over again. So we have this large bank of kind of, we know that if, if we get a chance to be around close to somebody and let them experience God's power, God's grace and other things, even when it's, even when it's, uh, dreams and other things will happen to people and will open, open them up. So some kind of encounter. But the, another theme through that, you take those three things, another connected theme, and this is going to be very important to where we're going to end up today in this material on Mark 11, is that God's people are kind of the conduit by which those encounters are made. So these encounters, power, truth, and allegiance, are not happening just like, just like out of the air. They're mediated because there's God's people that bring God's presence into a world of lives that are broken and far from Him. So they become just like that Christian girl who told her friend, you go and pray for your father. I, I, I was at a service one time and the lady, they were introducing visitors, and the lady looked kind of familiar and I was like, mm, you know, I think I've seen you. And I said, well, where, where, why do I know your face? And she said, oh, you visited me on Thursday. I mean, I just... A few days before, I'd been in that community with the pastor. We were doing some visitation. And I didn't really pay much attention. She was behind the gate, and they, the ladies talked to her. That very Sunday, she gave her life to Christ. And I said, why? That's really strange. You know, people don't do that so fast. What happened? She said, well, you visited me on Thursday, and on Friday, I had a dream. And she connected that dream to our visitation. We visited her house and came to her little girl was coming to church. And we came to her house, we talked to her, we prayed for her. The next day she had a dream. She said, I dreamt I was standing in Thai, traditional Thai outfit, and Jesus was in front of me and asked me to come worship him. Wow. And she connected that to us. So the it wasn't just she dreamed out of nowhere. She There was people, and then she dreamed. And in the Muslim world, this is very interesting, I was listening to a guy talk about this, who had done a lot of convert interviews. He said, when Jesus... Uh, appears to Muslims in dreams. One of the things, the common themes that he says is, go find a Christian to tell you more about me. Go find a Christian. And he said, I always tell my team members, make sure people know you're a Christian because when Jesus appears to them, if they don't know you're a Christian, they're not even going to know to ask you. So buddy, they better know you're a Christian because when Jesus appears to them, he said, go find a Christian. They better find you. So there's a, there's a conduit by which it's like God's presence, God's reality, God's Tangibility, if you want to say that, is mediated as, as through us as a conduit to people's lives. Now, let's jump into this text. I think that, that's going to help make us a little bit more um, aware of where we're going with this. Let's turn to Mark 11 here. Let me read some. So, it begins with the what we know as the triumphal entry, this whole thing, what we call Palm Sunday. So, they're coming up to Jerusalem. He says, go ahead, find a colt. Get this colt. So, they go out. They find it. They untie it. People say, hey, what do you do with that cold jeep? And they answered like Jesus had told them, let him go. And so they brought the cold to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks over, and he sat on them. Now let's pick up verse 8. I'll read from there. It says, many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Thus, our Palm Sunday. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. 
This is a quote from Psalm 118. And at that era, it had a messianic implications already. So people understood this, is that that, that thing in the Psalm 118 passage and the cornerstones of the that was having to do with God's anointed one. And the imagery, again, is very, very specific. The sitting on the, the colt is out of Zechariah 9, 9 that God's, that God's uh, king would come into Jerusalem riding on uh, you know, uh, this kind of animal like that. So it says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. So on this day, in this event, he, there's very explicit imagery already of the anointed one, God's anointed servant, has come. But what we, what we run into all through the Gospels is that Jesus is constantly, constantly carving out space for himself for him to define what it means to be the anointed one, God's Messiah. That others are always trying to impute on you and say, well, you should do this, Jesus, you should do that. So John's like, you know, John the Baptist in prison, he's not sure. Hey, I'm not sure. Are you the one who should come or not? Because you're not fitting any of my categories what Messiah was supposed to be. There are all these streams out there in the Old Testament that never were really like linked together. So there was this kingly stream and this prophetic stream and priestly stream. And there was a suffering stream that most people didn't really pay much attention to. So they, they were all thinking, hey, Messiah, what's Messiah supposed to do? He's supposed to come. He's supposed to rebuild the temple. He's supposed to start this eschatological end-time glory. And he's supposed to fight God's battle and whoop all these Romans and the enemies of us that are there. And Jesus consistently did not do stuff like that. So he was like, you know, carving out space to say, wait a minute, I'm something different than you think. So he enters Jerusalem, and where does he go? He goes right to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Verse 12 says, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing the distance of fig tree in leaf, he went out to find if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Now, one of the critical parts of this whole passage, why it's so blasphemously difficult to understand is, what does it mean by Mark's comment, because it was not the season for figs? Okay, so that's, hold that in your mind then. This is a very important part. Then he said the tree, he curses the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. So that's kind of a strange thing too. Jesus cursed the tree, there's no figs on it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers, the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And as he taught them, he said, so now Jesus does this action, and then he says, he quotes two things from the Old Testament. He quotes Isaiah 56. Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? What, what was the first song we sang today? We speak to nations. We talk about God, God's word, God's rule coming to nations. So Jesus does this thing, and then he says, Hey, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it. And he, this is a quote from Jeremiah 7, verse 11. You've made it a den of robbers. So, of course, this angers the chief priest. They're thinking, man, how can we kill this guy? Now look at verse 20. In the morning, they go, they're coming back in again. They saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered this. He says, wow, Rabbi, look, the fig tree and curse is withered. And then comes this very strange teaching, kind of out of the blue, on, on prayer. Jesus said, hey, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, if anyone says this mount, this mountain, and it's a demonstrative there, very specific to this mountain here, this temple mount where we are. If anyone says to this mountain, Go, throw yourself in the sea, and does not doubt his heart, but believe what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you've received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. So what happens is, is that you have strung together here a series of, of texts that to us seem to make like have no connected sense at all. It's one of the more difficult passages in scripture for people to understand is like this stuff just kind of like pops out of everywhere. So what does Jesus mean by this symbolic action? What is he, what's he doing? Why is he cursing fig trees? Uh, what's this stuff about prayer and forgiveness on this day when he comes, when he comes in here? So what I want to try to do, I'm gonna to try to do two things here. Okay? One is I want to try to weave this together into one coherent set of actions that has a meaning, a very important meaning. So I'm gonna to try to weave that together relatively briefly. 
Then I want to look at the implications of what that meaning is for us as God's people today. So we're going to look first at the text and say, okay, what, what's kind of going on here? Try to locate some of these things and then try to tease out of that some things. So I'm going to give you three kind of application sort of deals that, that what this means and kind of look back into our early, my, my first illustration about God's people being a conduit of his grace and presence to the world. So Jesus has come into the city in explicit messianic terms. And what happens is, is that what Mark has done is, is what ancient writers often did is they bracketed things that they wanted that they wanted to kind of make us pay attention to. So he, he puts the story of the temple cleansing. So he comes into town, he goes to the temple, and he cleanses the temple. He puts that story between the cursing and the fig tree. So what, what it says is that that action there and the cursing of the fig tree are kind of related things. Like As the readers, the disciples, they don't get it because they're just kind of walking through this. They're, they're living on a different level. We're the reader sitting back here, and Mark's telling us uh, on this big picture of what's happening here, that the cursing of the fig tree and Jesus coming in and cleansing the temple, and with a very symbolic action. I mean, the next day, these guys were probably back in business. This wasn't meant to, like, disrupt and stop the whole thing. He comes in, it's kind of a symbolic action. This does something, it's kind of a one-off, and things are going to go back to business. But he then brings out these Old Testament scriptures. So it's related. So people have people have wrestled with that. So what, is, what does Jesus mean by the symbolic action? And so I'm going to dispense with a lot of all the argument and just kind of say that, that people now, in looking at this as they've kind of worked back through this and worked back through the symbolic action of Jesus, say wait, that probably what this means is, is it's talking not about the cleansing of the temple, like, well, the temple's sort of defective, it's been profane, and people aren't so good, so let's make it better. What it's saying is the temple is going to be destroyed. Now, if you go home later on and look at the rest of Mark 12 and 13, Jesus is very explicit about his authority as the son of David, as the cornerstone, as the one who speaks to judge the temple. And he says in 13, in the beginning of that passage there, that it is going to be raised down to the ground. So this has to do with the destruction of the temple. So then the question is, the two big problems are, what do these Old Testament verses mean? And what does that thing with the fig thing, figs mean? The verses actually support the notion of this destruction of the temple. The Isaiah 56 passage talks about Gentiles. So these are people that are not Jews. Gentiles becoming part of God's family. So they become Sabbath keepers and they seek after the Lord. And so that's the, the part about it's there to be a, it's to be, his house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. So it's not simply Jewish people. <coughs> But it goes outside of that. God's going to establish his covenant relationship with people outside of that. But in the context of that passage there, the Israel, it says the watchmen are blind. So Israel itself, this is something that's going to happen in the future, but these people, they're not, they're not tracking with what God, with what God's doing. So here, hang on, I got my glasses, so I gotta shift this up a little bit. My eyes are a little bit blurry. I'm sorry. My bad. So here. It says, Jesus asserts that this temple is not the house of glory that the prophets anticipated. So prophetic literature anticipates this wonderful Ezekiel and Isaiah, this wonderful house people are going to flow into. He says, this is not the temple and the, of, of glory here, but this thing's going to be destroyed. And in fact, these, these Gentiles here, uh, it's, it's not the cleansing, is not about making room for them, but that this is not the temple. That Gentiles will be drawn to. So there is going to be a drawing to them. Gentiles are going to come, but this is not the temple. Then the, the Jeremiah verse is very interesting. Uh, I was doing some reading on this, and I, I never, in English, I had never really noticed it, but the two words that he's made a den of robbers, I never really caught on to that. The Jeremiah 7 passage is very, very interesting because Jeremiah stand, is told by the Lord, stand in the temple. And he then tells him, he said, God's going to judge this temple because you guys have turned it into, in essence, a magic charm. What you've done is said, hey, we can do whatever we want, be as bad as we want, but the temple, the temple, the temple, we can just stand here because we're God's people. God's going to protect us because the temple is a symbol of his presence. So we can stand in the temple. We can be nasty. We can steal. We can commit adultery. We can do all kinds of horrible stuff, but this is our magic charm. And he says, you have made it a den of robbers or brigands. So in other words, what it was, was not the place robbery occurred, but the place where robbers flee to escape 
after they've done their bad deed. So he said, you've made it a den of robbers. So Jesus comes in and says, look, this is not, this passage here, he quotes the Isaiah 56 passage, this isn't the temple, this isn't the place that people are going to be drawn to, because my place is going to draw all the peoples of the earth, and then secondly, you guys have turned it in the same way as in Jeremiah says, you've turned it into a den of robbers, you've turned a place where you think, hey, this is like our magic charm, where we can simply be protected. So it comes back to the cursing of the, 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 the figs, that little editorial comment, it wasn't the time for figs. Well, in there, be, because of the, sim, again, the symbolic action of the cursing of the fig trees, the cursing of the temple, the, the judgment that will come, it's like simply this, it's not, this is not the time. The, there's no, there, the, here's a tree, there's no figs on it because it's not expected there be figs on it. This is not the time, this is not the temple, and this thing is going to be, and this kind of thing is going to be destroyed. And so instead of it being a time of fruitfulness and harvest to bring the Gentiles in, no, this isn't the institution that's going to bring the Gentiles in. It is going to be destroyed. So as we move into the passage on prayer, then it's like, well, okay, now what, how, why do they append this whole thing on prayer? Is that Jesus is saying here that there's a new community being formed. And this new community being formed becomes the conduit, becomes the, the place where God dwells among them and brings his powerful forgiveness to the world. So as they come back, he teaches them a lesson about prayer because if they're going to be God's people, then they're, then they're going to be praying and praying in faith because they're going to be the instruments that God uses. And they're going to be forgiveness expressed there because in Jesus and through Jesus' community, that forgiveness extend, extends out into the world. So, the, so in one united theme, all the way from the initial tabernacle and then the temples that were built, now there's a new place where God's presence is. And it is not locked inside of a single building of mortar and stone. It is God's people where God's presence dwells with them. And through them, at the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, as the Spirit comes upon them, it's the Spirit then that now inaugurates them and that, that presence of God goes out to the whole world. So here, so here in this Mark 11 uh, piece, what we see is the, the unified sort of story is this temple is not going to be the temple that draws the Gentiles to. It's not going to be a renewed thing. That is in Jesus and in the community that Jesus is going to create. And that community is going to live out its life in prayer and in forgiveness and offering forgiveness to other people. So let's think about some of the implications of what that means for us as God's people in God's mission. The first thing is this. It is our DNA to be people who participate in God's mission. So it's not something that I sign on extra to. It's like, oh, I'm a Christian. Yeah, you know, Jesus is cool. He's going to do some nice stuff for me. And so, you know, maybe I'll just sort of add on doing some stuff for him over here. Like, like we have a compartment that we sort of add on. It is precisely who we are. And the reason we are constituted as God's people is that God, the living God, is going to dwell. We become the new temple of the living gods, not just as individuals, but as a corporate people. We are the new temple. We are the place where true worship happens. That's what Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. He said in, in Corinth, he said, you are the temple of the living God. There's temples everywhere. There's worship, wrong worship, misguided worship, inappropriate worship, a misunderstood uh, of who they're worshiping. All over Corinth, he said, but you are the temple of the living God. God's is among you. And what that means is that we are then constituted by the very nature of what we are to be a people in God's mission. So God's redemptive purpose becomes our redemptive purpose. We are drawn into a covenant, into a relationship with Him, not just to do our own stuff and sort of, sort of like say, okay, God, you know, help me make my stuff go better, you know, help me get another car and a nicer house and pillow for my back and some more lemonade because I'm thirsty and it's more about, he says, you become my people so that then through you I accomplish your purposes on earth. There's a powerful passage in, in Genesis 18 that sort of relates to this. I'm just going to allude to it. You can go back and read this. 
when there's a conversation, the Lord and Abraham are kind of walking along, and the Lord says, hey, should I tell Abraham what I'm going to do? It's that Sodom and Gomorrah judgment passage. Should I tell him what I'm going to do? And he relates. He goes back and tells the whole promise. He says, well, surely through Abraham here, he's going to, he's going to teach his children. He's going to bring blessing. I'm going to bless him. And he's going to bring blessing, he says, to all the families, all the nations, the tribes and tongues. That's where the, those, those words get down to that kind of level of the earth. He's going to do that. He said, because I've chosen him so that this will happen. And that he will teach his children to the ways of the Lord and to do righteousness and justice. So in one passage, you have choosing Christian behavior or behavior ethics, and you have the mission all woven together. So God calls a people to himself to do what? To do his mission, to battle evil in the world. So at the very DNA level of what we are, we are out in this world with God's as God's holy presence to bring grace, to bring mercy, to show His greatness, to do all the things that we sang about, but we do it out in the world, as corporately and as we move out. I, I was hunting for a picture. I thought I had a picture. I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't find it this morning. But there's a there's a lady that a very simple woman. She's actually about the same age I am, and she's. She's like third convert deep down in the line of people that have come to the Lord. Like 15 years ago, I led an urban poor lady to the Lord, and then she had a friend come to the Lord, and we were running a house group. Then that thing fell apart. They got in a fight. They moved off. But when I came back to Thailand in 2007, I went to visit one of those families, and I, I said, hey, I want you, it's time to re-up your faith. I heard you guys had a bit of an argument. You know, come on back to church. So I, I said, why don't you come this Sunday to, down to Pastor Faye's church and come out and hang out with me? And so she said, okay. Lot. So P. Lot said, yeah, I'm going to come to church. Well, she shows up with this, this other woman who comes with her, you know. And very strangely, because this doesn't usually happen that fast, very strangely, at the end of the service, Pastor Pay says, hey, does anybody here want to invite Jesus Christ to your life? And so this lady's name, Pa, Pari, Empty Ri. Pari raises her hand and they pray with her and, and she asks Jesus in her life. So I was like, wow, that's really, that's pretty wild. So we went up to her house. We were engaging, talking to her, and finding out some of her story and how she came to faith. We ended up starting a Bible study up in her home. And what we watched was a very interesting thing with this very simple woman. So she's got a little place. And what she does, she sells coffee and, and orange juice. So most of her day is spent, she goes out early in the morning and buys those little teeny, teeny oranges like we don't have here that we have you know, have in Thailand and the Philippines, I'm sure. Little teeny oranges. And she just she's just punching that thing down, just making orange juice by hand, punching that thing down, punching that thing down. And she's got little cookies and stuff, and people come. Well, she's in a pretty rough neighborhood. You know, people are coming by. And after this woman, no education, no no real background or anything, doesn't have anything to offer, but we just saw her life kind of like light up. Like she just was had this all of a sudden, I call it a sense of purpose. So people would come by, and a lot of these were like ladies of the night and stuff, you know, and, you know, really strange clothing and weird. And she'd just, hey, hey, why don't you come and study the Bible with us? Or, oh, bah, you know, why don't you come with Ba down to church? You know, so we'd have people, I remember being in Bay's church and standing next to people that just looked like ghouls, you know, like out of a Halloween thing, you know. Tears streaming down their cheeks. They didn't, they didn't understand one thing, but they were touched by God's presence. Yeah. And they, you know, start praying, and she had people come to this Bible study. And so there was this steady stream of people that she's brought to faith. Now, this Muslim guy, Lungwan, at the new place that she lived, he comes down to church one day, same thing, thing no clue. We were all stand up worshiping, and the pastor would say, you can sit down, and Lungwan would just be standing there in the front, just right in the middle like this. Hands straight. People have to come and say, no, no, uncle, please sit down, please sit down. He had no clue. But this guy's a Muslim background guy that family disowned, nobody cares about him, gave his life to Jesus. And but the vector in all of this is poverty. This uneducated, poor, in debt, a lot of life problems, kid on drugs, messed up family, woman is this light for Jesus. Now in reflecting on that, I've thought many times, okay, what is how do you explain that? How do you explain that people like we have everything going for us and cannot get a word out, out of our mouths to tell somebody about Jesus? We've got no time. We're too busy. We're in something. And here's this very simple woman, and she just all of a sudden blossoms into this marvelous light and grace that she connects people to Jesus. I don't think she would ever put it in this kind of terminology, but... I feel like that what happened is, is that she found out that her
her little story that meant nothing in her society. When placed in God's big story, it means a lot. It's like her story suddenly took on meaning because now it was placed in this bigger story of God's redemptive mission. She became a part of this wonderful, beautiful thing, God's family. And now all of a sudden has this purpose to tell this story. It didn't mean her problems away. She's got a bundle of problems. And, but now she's got someone walking through the problems. Now she's got a family. And she's telling this story. And that is what it means in my, in my thinking as we are, we are God's presence because now God's tabernacling with us. And our life then is shaped and takes on the contours of his redemptive mission because we're his people. Because it's our DNA. It's what we are. It's our story in his story. And the living God dwells in us and through us. Now, as the temple, we are, as the temple, we, this is the temple. Jesus and his body are the temple that the peoples are drawn to. So when you look at scripture, there's very clearly, there's an inward impulse. There's the, the for instance, the prophetic vision of the peoples coming to Mount Zion to, to, to come and worship there. But there's also an outward impulse impulse that thrusts us out. So we let our light shine. People see the light come to us. But we also go out into the world. So the Holy Spirit says, separate to me Paul and Barnabas. I'm going to send them out. And the disciple, the apostles themselves cited an Isaiah passage and said, okay, you're going to be a light for the Gentiles so that my salvation goes to the end of the earth. Well, you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So there's this toggling inward and there's also this outward thrust. So as the people of God, the temple that people are drawn to, we have to find ourselves out in that world. And that's precisely why you have people like myself, people that God calls and says, go out and go to another place. Let me show you this diagram. Up on the, it's going to come up on the PowerPoint here. But this is a map of the world looking at the various status of the Christian faith and the ethno-linguistic group, groups of the world. I want you to pay attention just to the part in red. That red part there, we call the red zone. Sometimes it's been called the 1040 window, other kinds of other kinds of things. It's primarily the Buddhist world, the Muslim world, the Hindu world. And it makes up 40% of our world. And Christian demographers are now telling us that 86% of the people who live in that red zone have never met a Christian. They do not know a single Christian. They have no one to tell them the story of Jesus Christ. So there is no tabernacle, there is no presence, there is no temple present for them to go to because there's nobody there on the ground. So a mission critical function, the reason why you have you know, missionaries come in, the reason why like, I'm here today is because people, God's people send folk, folk forth that we go out into those places to get boots on the ground. So a mission critical function in our world, if we believe this book, is to say, what do we do? How do we live in a way that we can make a difference in that red zone and ensure that there are people on the ground to tell the story of Jesus Christ, to be that conduit of blessing because this is the temple that people are going to be drawn to. If there's nobody there, there's no way to get the message out. So these people in the red zone are not simply not Christians. Your neighbors aren't Christians. You have friends and people in the next year. They're, they're not believers. These are people that don't have you. They don't have a church nearby. They don't have access to the saving message of Jesus Christ. And so one of the critical functions that we have to do is get people who will go and stay for a long time and hang out and tell that story of Jesus. So let me illustrate something. I've been telling people about this. I've been liking to tell this story simply because it's the next slide there. You know, because it's such a you know act of grace. It's such a cool thing that happened. But also it illustrates a point that I've been trying to make about about going out and staying for a long time. Sometimes people look at me, man, you stayed in one place for 26 years. You're like, did it not work? Or, you know, they, they, they're, they're so used to people just sort of going on these little short things that it's hard for them to get their mind around. Why would you stay somewhere so long? Well, Thailand has very, very few, few Christians. And, and it, it, there's massive millions of people that don't know a Christian, have never met a Christian. So somebody's got to go tell them. But I tell people, it is in doing God's mission, being the temple of God, in one sense, is simple. It is very simple. But it is not simplistic. So let me tell you a story about this little kid. Her back's turned to us. Her name is, her name, uh, is uh, I'm going to tell you in a second here. What happened was we were tutoring in this place where I got kicked out, actually. And uh, as a Muslim man out of the blue just said, hey, Alan, I really like what you guys are doing. Why don't you come and do it in my area? This is another little slum area that was nearby. 
So we went down and talked to the moms. It turned out it was kind of part Muslim, part buddhist -y. And so we hooked stuff up. We set a day. We said, yeah, we're going to come. So first day, I got the little kids out of like a little stoop right behind, right behind where we are. There's like a little ramshackle house, you know. And got the little stoops. <laughs> These little guys are out there. And I was going to have my colleague, who doesn't speak Thai yet, who's studying. I was going to have him do the tutoring stuff. And, but I was getting the ball around, so I was asking the kids their names. I said, Chudurai, Chudurai, what's your name, what's your name? So the little Muslim kids, they have their little names. So, Rauf, Hamida, Hamida, you know. And the little Thai kids all have, like, nicknames. So it's Bak, Bak, Bing, Ong, you know, some little fun <laughs> nicknames like that, you know. So I asked the little girl, why? I said, Chudurai, and she said, Mu, darkness. Now, when they give kids a bad nickname, or an adult a bad nickname, Porky, Fatty, whatever, I, I won't call them that. I'll just say, uh, what's your two team, what's your real name? But this kid, she just said moot, and it just snapped out of my mouth. They said, check me out, I won't use it. I said, your name's Light. Her little face just beamed, you know. So we went on, and, I, and I, what happened was I kind of noticed that that kid, out of all these little ones, had some kind of spiritual interest. There was something there, so we gave her a uh, comic book Bible kind of a thing. And one day I had this conversation. I was, you know, I'm always trying to work with the parents and talk to the adults and stuff. So I'm in Auntie Shah. And um, so Ara comes in and sits down. She says, oh, I'm reading this book. And so I said, well, that's great. You know, Jesus loves you. And share with her a little bit. She said, yeah, Mommy's taking me to the temple and I'm making me chant and everything. And so I was walking home and I had, I just prayed. And as I was going home, I thought, man, she lives with Muslims. Your mom's sitting in the temple. And now these white guys show up and say, Jesus loves you. How hard is it to navigate and try to figure that out when you're nine years old? Yeah. It's like, Jesus, reveal yourself to little Salam. Help her to know you. In all of this, help her to know you. Now, I came back to the States. I called Pastor Bay, and, and just he told me a story. I started weeping because he said, guess what? He said, one of the moms came with her kids and brought a Muslim teenager, brought Salam down, and Salam gave her life to Jesus. So cool. And then go to the next slide, man. And then, like, you know, six months later, she brought her dad down to the anniversary celebration of the church, and her dad got saved, you know? So, I mean, so now there's two people. This little kid, you know, so I became, really, so I, she really became light like that. Now, that's just a fantastic, you know, grace filled story. But here's, what, here's the deal it looks, on the surface, what does it look like? Simple. Hey, Alan, you were tutoring English. You know, any person who speaks English, you can tutor English, man. And you can talk uh, and do a bunch of looks. That's easy. Yeah, it does. It looks simple. But it's embedded. Think of this. All of this that happened is embedded in all those years, two decades plus, of Thai language competency, culture competency, walking the streets, fasting and praying, asking the Lord for a specific strategy, relationships with Muslim community leaders, relationships with Pastor Bain there on the left, on the, the guy with the glasses, and, and, and the Thai church, the shepherd, all of that stuff happened. And it's because we were there a long time that that kind of thing could happen, that the word could go forth. So there's a function about in, in the church that's pushing us forward out into the places. So we have to be God's people here, but there's also there's a sending. God's going to hide people up and send them and get them out there. Now, the last thing is this lesson on prayer. This is a weird thing. So we're, by DNA, we're God's people. By, by the, temp, the, temp, the temple, we are the temple that the Gentiles are going to be drawn to. And God's going to send some of those out. He's going to get us out there. But also, as we do this, prayer is a part of it. The disciples were clueless about all this symbolism. They, this is a reflection that came later on. They're just walking, hey, man, you cursed something. When, that's what they're amazed about. You cursed that tree. Now the things, you know, dried up from the roots. What does that mean? And so Jesus tell, tells them this little lesson on prayer. So they're getting level one. You know, there's a bigger level up there about, about the whole, you know, curse, the destruction of the temple. But they're getting just like level one. He says, have faith in God. Believe what you ask for. So as we go out of this world as the temple, as God's conduit into this world, we're going to conduct ourselves and do it in prayer. And as we do this, it is, remember, and this is the key part, so many people have taken that verse and like wrenched it out of its context, and oh, you know, ask anything, you have faith, believe anything, you know, so we're praying for Mercedes and Lexus and all this kind of stuff, you know, jump, that doesn't matter to God. He told this promise in prayer to a bunch of people, the 12 guys, and he said, hey, you know what? You're going to go out and change the world. You are my temple. You're going to go out. I'm going to send you abroad out so that you can do as the Father sent me. I'm sending you. He sent this to people, and he was trying to teach them a stance in the world that said, turn yourself in this world, and as you face these various mountains of impossibility, which is 
what that metaphor meant to Jews is that the things go root, the mountains are deep and they're rooted, so moving it was impossible. As you face this impossible stuff, pray in faith and believe God, and He will do amazing yeah. stuff yeah. in your life. Yeah. So Jesus tells them that they are going to engage this world with a stance of prayer and look at stuff and say, it can't be done, but I'm going to believe God that it can be done. Amen. Now, this guy, Pastor, Pastor Bay here, I've been, I've been watching something happen, and in, 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 it's been very, very instructive. We'll go to the next slide, man. This is little family. It's this little son. That's the only kid they had. They tried out a lot of kids, but that's the only kid they had. And this guy, a uh, few few months ago, he and I are sitting like, right down here, like on the platform, and, and uh, he sat down. I preached, and he sat down. After, he kind of had his head in his hands, and he said, he said, he just said, "Madonna." He said, "Teacher." He said, "I'm new." He said, "I'm tired, man." He said, "I've been working for seven years on this church. He said, I got forty people." I've been mean, busting myself, working my fingers in the bone. I got 40 people. He said, I don't know what to do. And I said, hey, I don't know what to do either. We're out fasting, praying, asking God for direction. We don't know what to do either. So I said, let's just, we're in a safe spot, man. We don't know what to do. So we, we can just listen to God. So let's get up every day, keep listening to God, and see what, see what, he, see what happens. We just got to keep believing God. That very week, his son's heart started pounding so hard in his chest that he could see his shirt jumping like that. They ran into a hospital. He ended up in ICU for 30 years. Days with his heart racing between 170 and 200 beats a minute. They told him, they said, there's five things wrong with your kid's heart. Any one of them goes wrong and he's dead. He may have to, there's a virus that attacked his heart, so the valve wasn't working, it thinned it out, it swelled it up. And they said, he's going to be like this. It's permanent damage for the rest of his life that he will be in this case. They sent him home after 45 days, buckets of medicine, taking stuff. He could barely go up the steps to get into that, to, the, to the church up to the worship center without just huffing and puffing. And they said that's basically the rest of this kid's life. He's going to be on medicine to control his heart. So we started getting people praying. They started praying. Now here's, here's, this is what to me was so interesting about this thing of prayer. So oftentimes prayer is this kind of like, you know, it's like we're just punching the clock. Yeah, we're going to pray for a couple things here. You know, it's like, okay, I got some needs. I got some stuff. But when this stuff started to happen, his people, all of a sudden, it was like something, a light went on. And they said, wait a minute, there's something bigger going on in this context here. The week, the Sunday that they put that kid in the hospital, he went into the hospital Thursday. Sunday, thieves broke into the church with knives and were like trying to rip stuff off while they were having morning prayer upstairs. So they was like, wait a minute, something's happening. We are we're, we are here in this pregnant moment and God's trying to do something and we've got to start linking up. So it wasn't him commanding them. People just started showing up in his building praying. They come at 5 in the morning. They come at night. They were coming and praying. We, we got thousands of people said this all, all over the world. Said, pray for little uh, Theo. Ask God to heal him. Ask God to touch his heart. Five months later, show him that picture in the next slide. Man. Five months later, he went to the doctor. They shot an x-ray of him. The doctors went back and said, what we got the wrong kid? Because this heart's the right size. So his heart went back to his heart. The valves, the thing picking back up, the little guy was healed. And, but his people have fired Lit under. He said, they show up now. We used to prayer walk once a week on every Saturday. They get up in the morning. We'd spend two hours prayer walk. Like he said, we prayer walk two hours every night now. People show up at 6 o'clock. We wander through the community in prayer. They show up at the building at 9 o'clock. There's a movement in prayer because they're saying, wait a minute. We've got to believe God. Have faith in God that he's going to penetrate. Amen. Amen. So this is linked together. As God's people, we're part of God's redemptive mission. We are the place that he's going to draw people to. And we're going to conduct ourselves how? In prayer. And we have to forgive each other as we do it. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you for Scripture, Lord, your word, your revelation to us. And all of this stuff that happened on Palm Sunday in those days there afterwards, you prepared to go to cross. You were trying to tell people that you were going to judge that institution and raise up a family in which a people you would tabernacle be among so that they could be a light to this world. Lord, guide us today in Jesus' name. Send the power of your Holy Spirit to guide us and release us to do your mission and task. song about nations. So we wanted to stand up really? Shall we all right up? Shall we all stand up, Charisma?
just want us to respond to what God has said. You know, we always say this, our success as a church is not based on our seating capacity, but on our sensing capacity. Amen? We are called by God temples, and we are called by God as the DNA of God to go to mission. Amen? Aren't we honored, charisma, that we have partner and we have a missionary to Thailand like Pastor Alan Johnson, that we are our support. For 26 years, giving his life to the Thai people. Now I'm just asking us today, some of you probably will be going to foreign mission like Melanie Herring and uh, John a few months from now. But whether we are local or going out international, we are all God's missionaries, amen. We live in a world that is sick, dying, and needs healing of Jesus Christ. So to this morning, I would like us to respond. Would you mind coming to the altar? We haven't done this for a while. Just come to the altar. As we sing, we speak to the nation. Picture in your mind what nation that you represent. What people group in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your sphere of influence that you could touch with the love of Jesus through friendship, through connection, just being there for them. Amen. Let's just come forward and respond to the call of God to mission. Let's sing the song, Eva. We speak to nation. Hallelujah.
there's a, there's a very powerful saying it says, Christianity cannot save you. Only Christ can save you. But he said, Christianity can surely damn you. Because there are many people right around this area who are very confused about the Christian faith because they've seen bad stuff. They misunderstand it. So instead of it being a light, instead of it being a sign of God's will, it becomes a counter sign. It obscures who Jesus is. Part of this whole thing about, and the ending of that passage about forgiving one another so that your Heavenly Father can forgive you, is that in this new people of God, the temple of God, the presence of God among us, is that there needs, there needs to be a free flow of forgiveness in there. And His character needs to be expressed in us and through us. I want to pray right now. As, as I was just praying, I felt that today, a lot of times I'm you know, praying while we're worshiping to the Lord. What do you want to do today? And I want to pray for freedom from anything that keeps us from expressing God's character, His love and grace. And I felt like there's someone here who's like struggling. You're in a struggle that's just beyond you. You, you're, you feel like some of this stuff has grabbed you and you can't be in the longing in your heart you want to be, but you're just not there yet. Let's pray for freedom in Jesus' name. Let's pray for forgiveness to flow in Jesus' name. Let's pray that this place will be a safe place. People would come here. They sense God's presence here. They sense God's presence here. Let there be a place where they can find forgiveness. Where forgiveness can be granted to them. Where, where bondages can be broken in Jesus' name. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, send your spirit to me. Lord, I pray for that one today who might feel just all bound up. Lord, locked by stuff in their life. They know it's not where they want to be. Free them in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit today. By the immeasurably great power of the risen Christ, Lord, set them free today in Jesus' name. Turn the light bulb on, Lord, and release them in Christ's name that there would be a walk in holiness, in purity, and in focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that this Christmas Christian Center, Lord, that this place would be a place of healing, a place of forgiveness. Lord, I pray to drive out bitterness, Lord, and anger. I pray that the Holy Spirit, God, would help this to be a family with us. People who come in, people who just walk in, Lord, and they come in, they would know that this is a place where God dwells. And let people find freedom here, Lord, in Amen. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Work through us and use us. Send your spirit upon us to be your people in Jesus' name. Jesus, as we all know, after five days, those people who shouted, hail him, gave him a standing ovation, they took, took up their clothes, shouted Hosanna, after five days, they flipped love, and they shouted, nail him, crucify him. I wonder that we will be loyal to Jesus and the mission of Jesus, amen? That we will always be hailing Him, praising Him. And that's why we have tithes and offering. That is one way we could declare and praise God that He is the source of everything. It is also one way that we could be the conduit, like what Pastor Alan is saying. Imagine those red stone. When we see it visually, 40% of places in the world, they don't know about Jesus. They don't, they don't have Bibles. They don't have Christian people. And we become the conduit of Jesus Christ by three things. By sending. That's why our tax and offering, we channel our tithes and offering, of course, provision here locally and globally supporting our missionary by praying, as Pastor Alan has asked us, the first dawn, the, the movement that they're doing, reaching out to the Muslim in uh, Thailand, it will be spiritual warfare there, lift him up in prayer.
by, by sending is through our money, by, by praying, and also by going. And I challenge you, Charisma. We are a very mission-minded church. I challenge you, get a passport. Because you don't know, one day, you'll be one of those people who will be going out of the nations. Amen, somebody. One day, you will be called by God. So let's just get them ready. So today, let's prepare our tithes and offering. There are three ways you could do this. First is the traditional way of giving as we pass the offering basket. Number two is we have a business reply by mail. You don't need to pay for the postage. It's prepaid. Whenever you feel led and uh, you get paid and you forgot your paycheck today, just drop it off and send it. And also the third way is through online giving at charismachristencenter.com or .net. Just, uh, just log in and you could just feel free to give your tithes and offering. So today, Charisma, let's participate. Let's feel the, the call of God to answer the call to the mission that God has called us as a local church, as a sending and healing congregation. Father, we are so honored today to witness the story of Pastor Alan Johnson, that his life is a message poured out, Lord, for the country of Thailand. We thank you, Lord, that many, many, many people in the 26 years of staying there has been transformed, oh God, has been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And as a local church, God, we are just honored, God, that one day when we get to heaven, we'll see those Thai brothers and sisters, and they will say to us, thank you for sending Alan to Thailand. I'm one of the people that got converted to Christianity. Because of the life of this man of God. Lord, we thank you for this time that we could participate in the call of God. Help us, Lord, not to forget that DNA of the church is mission of God. We love to give and we live to give. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's just honor God right now as we gave our tithes and offering, calling on the ushers.